It's KC 101. It's time for another edition of Saturday with Seniors here on KC 101. Joining us in our studio, Steve McCluskey from Mansfield. And we're going to hear his life story here. Born in 1953. I think that actually makes you our youngest Saturday with Seniors, just to give people a disclaimer. But you've got such a great story. We want you to come down and join us. Good morning. Good morning, Kevin. How are you? Well, wonderful. Um, we've met so many times before because you have a passion and a love of history in Tioga County as right, well. Right. But you also got quite a bit of a story in your life here. So you weren't born in Tioga County, but where did it all start for you? I was born in Danville, Pennsylvania, and I came from a very large family. My father was a basketball coach, a teacher and the high school basketball coach in Danville. I have five brothers and three sisters. We adopted two more. We had 40 foster kids come through our home. My parents were incredibly... Your parents fostered 40 kids and had, I lost track of them, eight of their own, was that, with the, between the adopted? And then, and then two of the foster kids they ended up adopting. I think people, for one, had larger families at that time, but that's what they wanted to do. My father was very, very successful at what he did. He was one of Pennsylvania's premier basketball coaches. He became a great promoter of, of his sport. He was more than a uh, coach, although he was very, very good at coach. He lived it and loved it. He lived it and loved it and created an aura about it. And everybody participated in basketball or one of the many, many events he did. He also ran the playground, the Washies playground on Danville. It's, it's still there. It's a very large playground. And he also had a Sunnybrook basketball camp for boys. In that era, basketball camps were just starting out. It was really a phenomena sort of a thing. And because of that, I got to work at his camp as a very young kid through most of my life and got to meet some of the legends of college basketball. Bobby Knight would come down and he would do uh, sessions there. Jim Valvano, the famous coach who led North Carolina to a national championship, was the coach at Bucknell at that time. And Matt Gukas, who was the general manager of the Philadelphia 76ers and Stu Jack. I mean, phenomenal people that had gone to Mm -hmm. great accomplishments all came to this little basketball camp. Because your dad's passion and love yeah, of the sport right. and... Uh, yeah, because yeah. of the, that whole thing. We used to kid that he kept on having children until he had his own basketball team. Uh, other five <laughs> sons. I was going to say he had enough for a few basketball yeah. teams. We all inherited something from our parents and mine became all those lessons I learned from my dad about how to promote things and how to create an energy and how to make it seem important. Strangely yeah. played a part of my life when I came up to Tiger County. So yeah, great place to live and a great era to live in. Sure. And your mom, I imagine, had her hands full with all these kids at the house and everything. Eight kids or whatever and yeah. 40 foster kids. Yeah. And my mother had a nursery school. So On top of all this. On top of all <laughs> Let's this. just have some more kids. She loved children. My mother was a beautiful person on the outside, but that was eclipsed by who she was on her inside. Anybody that ever was in contact with her, she made them feel so welcomed and so loved. Just absolutely a remarkable woman. She never learned how to drive. Even though we had all these children and all these aspects, we walked a lot of places. We lived in Riverside, which is right across the river from, of course, Danville. And uh, it is connected by the River Bridge, which is a long river bridge, which gets longer in the winter. (laughs) And windier and colder. Exactly, which is why it gets longer. But um, I've heard others talk, and we have spoken earlier about that. One, it's a great show, and I really enjoy listening to people's memories about life, and particularly particularly from people of that era and an era before Mayan where you didn't have any of the modern conveniences and you didn't have any of the social interactions that you had now, but you had a lot more friends and you had a lot more experiences and you were always outside. You know, if you were inside too long in my mother's and my father's house, they would throw you out. Yeah, get out of the house. Get out of the house. (laughs) Go out and do something and go find a friend. Yeah, absolutely. And that's what you did. And that's changed dramatically now. One of the things I heard in Common Alley on the show was in the winter, sleigh riding. Yeah, go and how, out and how, play in the snow. The exercise you can get from sledding in the snow is crazy. Well, how excited you yeah. were about having snow because it gave you something to do in the winter and a gathering for friends, you know. Snow forts and snowball oh fights my gosh. and snowmen yeah. and, yeah. and uh, you yeah. know. And the imagination that you could use and what you would create with those snowball fights and those yeah. scenarios, you know. You lived out the movies or you lived out a TV program. And um, even though we didn't have as much, we had a lot that was better. 
I sure. think, you know. Yeah, I think that that's really missed out on now. Um, how do you change that? You can't, you know. I mean, the world has changed yeah. and it's, it's here. Yeah, society. I, I just wonder if in 50 years, because I know you'll still be doing this show in 50 years. Yes, <laughs> I'll be my own guest in 50 years. <laughs> no, I'll be 100, 104 in 50 years. If the children that are raised in this era now will have those same type of memories. It just doesn't seem that you're developing the same closenesses or the same life experiences. And I'm not knocking it because my son, that's what they're social life is now but i mean he's playing with gamers in spain on a daily basis you people know? he's never really gonna meet Correct. with and Correct. sure and, and you know and i'm sure they have some interaction because they become friends because they have something in common it just doesn't seem yeah. the same to me but when i was a kid it was when the street lights came on you had to be home kind of concept yeah, yeah. you know Absolutely. we didn't have a cell phone to communicate with you they wanted you to check in every once in a while i remember my mom calling around trying to find me calling different houses to see if i was there those yeah. things have changed when you first grew up in your home did you have tv as a kid or do you remember your first tv uh, experience i you know i was born in 53 so they they probably got it a little bit after that aspect of it and it wasn't a new tv they had gotten a used tv uh black and white black one and white tv in the them. house if you're lucky and, uh, and get a, up to change the consoles because they're all uh, yeah. most of them were in console so it was a huge piece of uh, equipment you know watching sky king and roy rogers that's different tv than today too yeah yeah very much so and one of the things i do remember was going to the movies and you went to the matinees on saturday because they were cheaper or they were way cheaper <laughs> for one and i don't want to date myself by and be inaccurate about it but i i think it was a quarter or at the very most 50 cents which was real money at that period of time but you would get to see two movies two black mm -hmm. and whites with cartoons and the theater management would have a little bit of entertainment going in between yeah. And the place was jammed with kids. Yeah. Like great memories. It provided a basis for us to become who we were. Yeah. We had uh, Linda Steger on, and we were talking about her dad, John Antonio, yeah. the theater, how he used to do entertaining shows, and John's the club that he had with the kids in between the movies and the entertainment, and how the theater would be packed for the matinees with kids. Yep. And John was such an unbelievably creator. I mean, besides the radio networks that he created, along with Effie, but taking over that theater and doing the shows that they did there and the sense of community that they installed into that yeah. aspect of it, you know, that's what you were supposed to do. You were supposed to make a community better. You were supposed to provide a service mm -hmm. that made it everything better for everybody. And John and Effie were certainly um, were those. A funny side story of that. So when I came to Mansfield, I came here in 1971. I came to school at Mansfield prior to my even graduating from high school. So I was a pilot. It was a pilot program. Schools were so packed because of the baby movers, all the state system schools, that they would offer us summer session for the people who couldn't get in to the regular general sessions, which of course started in September at that time. What they would do is they would take you and you would go through a six week summer program. So you would do one semester during the summer. And then when people graduated or flunked out from that first semester of college, they would have openings okay. and then they would fit you into that opening. So they were that, that old story, look left and look right. Yeah. One of them's not going to be here and they're going to be replaced by someone Correct. who's in this program. We were the replacements. <laughs> yeah. You know, it was a great experience because it was 300 kids that were just out of high school that were thrown in together uh -huh. that were living on campus and we just had enough of older students to kind of guide us of what you're supposed to be doing and stuff none of them about academics of course, <laughs> but all about having fun and enjoying life and the newfound freedom that yeah. came with not living at home so a movie came out that was called Clockwork Orange. I don't know if you've ever seen it. Or heard I, I've, I've, it has a cult following, and I it haven't does. seen it, though, but that's about a, all I can tell you. It has a cult following, and it does. So life was changing radically in the early 70s at that time, and not always for the better, but it was changing radically. And because there were so many young people, they were beginning to have a political and a social economic power to them. And we went from Ozzy and Harriet and to the Beatles and the war in Vietnam, landing on the moon, all those crazy things. Life was changing at such an incredible point, but doesn't change as much as it seems to change today. So we went to the movies. People were dressed up as the people in this movie theater, in this movie, Clockwork Orange, and it was a uniquely different movie. John Antonio came out on the stage, and this place is full of college students, mm -hmm. okay? And for those that don't know, there was a movie theater on Main Street, Mansfield, near where the, the borough Twain, offices the are, the Twain Theater. Twain theater. Right, yeah, right. It's just blocks south of the light where yeah. we're talking about yeah. here. And I know everybody that lived in Mansfield and lived in that community would have really fond memories at that time of the Twain Theater. 
So John got up there, and John was a very devout, good Christian person. Everything about John was really what you should live your life like. And yet he was a community person who recognized that things were changing. So he stands up and he says, this is the first time we've ever done anything like this. He was honest, mm -hmm. a little bit anxious about this, and we're going to expect you not to get crazy and, you know, some civility. <laughs> <laughs> So the next thing you know, as he finishes his speech, all of a sudden, a beer can rolled down the aisle right down oh, to where he was, he was speaking. But he still showed the movie, and um, it just was part of the change of society, yeah. more so than anything else. When um, you were talking about Frank Youngworth before yep. the start of this and his community, so did he volunteer or did he get drafted? He knew he was going to get drafted, so I'm not sure whether he enlisted, but he knew it was coming, and so I do believe he was drafted. So there was a draft at that time. Mm -hmm. And the way to get out of the draft, of course, is to be in school and college. And I think the draft started in the mid-60s, and it ended in 71 or 72. But the year that the draft was going on, that I was coming up, so it was 18, so it must have been 71. So we had a draft party. We had 18 guys in this dorm room with a keg of beer, and we were 18 years old. Draft beer or a draft military well, party? It, was it a play it, on words? It was draft beer because <laughs> and a, it was at and a, a draft keg. party. You would, okay. get a, you would get a keg of beer. And uh, Times not that I was drinking, but I, but I was there, okay? <laughs> you could only go to the shingles at 18 to drink at that particular time. But, but I was there, and the draft was on the radio. That's how you got the information. So if your first number was coming up, mm -hmm. you would be number one. You were going to be drafted. And so the first person that we got drafted was a guy by the name of Tony Nardello. His birthday was number one. Tony was a student from Dunmore, a little Italian guy, of course. And Tony had a flaw in his physique. Good looking guy, nice guy. But his one eye went to one mm -hmm. direction and stuff. Tony was out of his mind with worry. All everybody else was yelling at him, number one, number one, number <laughs> one. He had to go to his physical, but when the guy said, look at me, and Tony goes, I am, he just <laughs> rejected him offhand. But my number was 279, and I announced to everybody that I wasn't going to be taken until the Viet Cong had control of Burger Boy downtown. Yeah. <laughs> because I was that late into the draft. But that's what your life was. You know what the amazing thing about that is? My father had five sons, and none of us served in the military. My older two brothers were affected because the draft deferment for college mm -hmm. students was still yeah. in, in fact when they got there. And then I got such a high draft number, and then my other brothers were too young, of course, at that time sure. to, to be done but that was a meaningful part of life that was a rite of passage that day when you turned 18 going to the post office yep fill out your card that you, yep. was so this was 1971 in mansfield there was another big change coming here in mansfield 1972 and that was hurricane agnes yep. were you there for that yeah the i was in danville at i was still a student here but there was the summer of course agnes started in uh june and i was in danville and of course danville got tremendously devastated. The downtown area suffered unbelievable damage and, you know, nothing like it. No, yeah. We still haven't lived through anything like that. Mansfield also got damaged, although not nearly as bad as... Um, like Tioga, Lawrenceville, that really... Correct, yeah. they did. The Corning was six feet underwater, a lot of yeah. it. Yeah, oh, Elmira. And, and Elmira. It changed, of course, what Elmira was. So Elmira was a very vibrant, healthy community. But after that flood, they never... Yeah. Came back from the, the downtown aspect of it. So, yeah, that did change it because what that changed to Mansfield, the flats area, the, the area that was typically flooded, what we consider downtown Mansfield now was not. But as you go down into the park area and then the lower part of Mansfield, the south side, the flats area was devastatingly flooded, as was Quarry Creek area. So where the plaza was now, uh, I had written a story about the state store opening in 1972. And yep. Seen the picture of it there out. in the yep. fl great yep. flood book there. Yep. There was Correct. National Guard was guarding the, they uh, the liquor guarding store. They were guarding it because they could not sell even the liquor courses in a contained thing once it was in the flood they could not resell that you cannot repurpose that and that was killing certain people to say just wash it off i'll take it give it yeah to you. <laughs> yeah and it did change everything because it brought in with the urban redevelopment which changed what mansfield looked like physically so the river bridge that used to go what we know now it became elevated when the corps of engineers started the construction for the lakes which were on the books prior people think that the lakes were created to mitigate it from ever being like it was again. But it was already passed in, in legislation. It started in the 1950s, late 1950s. Yeah, the people in Lambs Creek that lived there yeah. knew their days were numbered Correct. for a long time. So that didn't do anything 
to create the lakes, but it certainly kept it from not being fast tracked in, in mm-hmm. aspects of it. So that whole area where the Arden is now, which will now become the North Penn and Laurel campus and developed yeah. into that manner was all building. So it was more of a downtown environment that extended. The Grange was there. There were other buildings or apartment buildings. There were houses there on that street because the street was down about eight feet from where it is right now. So it changed that concept of what it was. When I came in the 1970s, Mansfield's downtown was much more of a thriving small town community because there were more stores there. Uh, the bank has certainly purchased a lot of things. It's been a great addition to it. It's great to have that bank headquartered in our community. It serves great purposes. They're very much supporters of our community. But where that parking lot was, the AMP was there. There were other stores mm-hmm. there. The downtown mirrored on one side to the other side. And it also went down Wellsboro Street that same way. That urban redevelopment created the opportunity to put a parking lot there. The parking lot soon gave way to the North Penn Comprehensive Health Services, which we were desperately in need of a health service aspect in town. The health service was in Papa V's prior to that. So it was a positive in a negative connotation. It just changed, you know, and life is about change. And so it changed what the core of Mansfield was. And 15 went right down through the middle of town. So you talk about Chaffer Jams. Now you complain if you sit at the light for one cycle of lights. Where is all this traffic coming from? <laughs> See, I didn't live here when Main Street Mansfield oh was Route 15. How backed yeah. up did that get? I mean, uh, so. Let me tell you. And then backing out onto that. So the only time you could back out of your parking stall... Mm-hmm was when the light It was still a diagonal traffic. parking It was still diagonal then. parking back then. Kind of a rarity, really. And it would take a long period of time to get through. And so people who lived here were going to be really happy when they built the bypass, of course, and they built the bypass, I think, in the 80s. But when it came time to put the bypass in and was actually going to be constructed, those same people were complaining because traffic would not go through downtown. Yep. Many of them were business owners, and now you're taking away a traffic flow that created a unique social economic strategy down there. So the Dutch Pantry was down there and that catered to buses coming through and yeah. people well, stopping Well, McDonald's there. where it's located now, you wouldn't have put Correct. it there. That was Correct. the main thoroughfare. Correct. And of course, the highway stopped right after that. After McDonald's got built, it was not many years before the highway came in and the bypass. Mm-hmm. Let me just give you a story about how that traffic pattern changed and how it did. So McDonald's was put in, I think it was in 1979 or in that general area. It was a stunning thing that McDonald's came to Mansfield. That was the first, Absolutely. right? It uh, was the first. I mean, people came McDonald's from 30, 40 in, miles to in, try in, this out. Exactly. We had a parade when it opened up. Yeah. A parade. <laughs> With Ronald McDonald in right. Ronald <laughs> McDonald was in the in parade. In person in the parade. The borough had to have a police officer stationed to handle traffic control in and out of McDonald's. And this is before a drive through windows were mm-hmm. taking over the, the industry. Yeah, yeah, taking over the industry and stuff. And you're right. It was a destination place to go. Just incredible. But it was also the place to go where all the buses, and remember, buses coming through Mansfield was a huge industry because they were going to Niagara Falls. And for those, and it's not too long ago, we remember those side little tourist booths. One of those is up across from the woodshed still where Niagara Falls would have Mm -hmm. a person stationed there to give you information about that. So Bob Walsh, Gene Walsh put the McDonald's in and Bob was his son. Bob owns the McDonald's franchises here in Wellsboro now. And he's a Mansfield guy, of course. And Bob was working the shift as a swing manager. Bus came on the lot, which happened all the time, all day long. This bus came on the lot and these little kids came off the bus and they faltered themselves in and they got in line and Bob motioned over the bus driver and the leader of the group because they always comp the bus driver and the leader. And Bob, which he probably asked 50 times during a day, so where are you guys from? Mm -hmm. And the guy goes, well, we're the Vienna Boys Chorus. And we were on our way, we just played at the White House and we were on our way (laughs) to Niagara Falls. And they stopped at McDonald's in Mansfield. To- Not only did they stop, Kenny. Yeah. So if you know Bob Walsh, Bob is one of those guys. Easy to strike up a conversation. And I go to sit back with this group. Bob goes, well, hey, how about a song? <laughs> <laughs> and the guy turns around, looks back at him and says, I'll ask the boys. So he gets back and he asks the boys. He said, gentlemen, we have just been offered the opportunity to sing if you'd like to. And they went ballistic. <laughs> they were so happy. And he told him later that the Vienna McDonald's had just opened in Austria. And so when the boys left their Mm -hmm. campus, which was a palace, that's where they always wanted to go to McDonald's. So so the next place they played after the White House was? The lobby 
of the McDonald's in Mansfield, Pennsylvania. And to this day, it is still the only McDonald's that the Vienna Boys Choir has ever performed. Has ever performed. <laughs> it was right at Christmas, and they sang. All right, who's got a picture two, of this? We need a picture. Somebody so I did, a, I did a story of yeah. it, and uh, Joyce will have it on the website if you look at past newsletters. The well, people when you're talking about Joyce, downtown. you're talking about the History Center in Correct. Mansfield. And for those Church. that have never been, and there's 41,000 people in Tiger County, probably 1,000 have been the History Center. The rest of you who haven't, you need to go see this. There is so much neat history and nostalgia and school uniforms from back in the 50s and pictures of everybody who graduated from Mansfield too uh, in there. That is just a tremendous collection of stuff. And you're involved with the History Center too as well, aren't you? I am. Joyce, for some reason, they had elected me as the president of the board. I, I just, I think I was the guy that didn't raise his hand. <laughs> Fast and everybody, enough. <laughs> yeah, correct. And uh, Kevin, I don't think people that live here appreciate what a great history that we have and great people that came from here and amazing Amazing things that we've done. We have Major League Baseball players. We have people. Well, how many play. Major League Baseball players came from Tyler County? Eight, uh, 10, 12 in uh, rough numbers? I, I, I would say a dozen, and you're still finding people occasionally that you would find that were way, way back in the time that did that. But one of those was Mike Azucazella, who played at the normal school then, Mansfield mm-hmm. University now. And Mike played on the 1927 New York Yankees. He was the roommate of Lou Gehring. They both signed the same day or the, played that first mm-hmm. year together. Al Todd, who became a great baseball player and was the catcher for the Philadelphia Phillies. He was the catcher of the first night game in Major League Baseball history when the Philadelphia Phillies played at Crosley Field in Chicago in 1935. He was the catcher at home plate in New York for the uh, New York Giants when the Hindenburg went overhead on its way to Lakers before it exploded. They stopped the game and all the players look up because the Hindenburg was so large it blotted out the sun. (laughs) And he hit a home run in that game and three hours later the Hindenburg exploded. So we just have incredible people. Tom McMillan, and and when I came to Mansfield, even I knew Tom McMillan. He was a year earlier than me at Mansfield High School. But Tom McMillan, the phenomena of Mansfield High School basketball, and Tom McMillan was so incredible. Him appearing in Sports Illustrated. He was on, on the cover, on the of, cover Sports of Sports Illustrated. Sports Illustrated. Very famous. I still see the picture of him tipping the ball in on the hoop. I can't explain to you how incredible that was. It was the national story of national stories about this phenomena being from Mansfield, Pennsylvania. And of course, Tom played in the NBA for 10 years and was a congressman and still comes back. We have his jersey. His jersey is at the history. His brother Jay went to Maryland before him and he was the all-time scorer there. Mr. Paul Snyder went on to own the NBA franchise at Buffalo. As a Mansfield guy, he was the guy that originally Mm -hmm. drafted Tom McMillan in the first round of the draft. Crazy. Yeah. The first two exhibition games he had, he had them at Mansfield's new Decker Gymnasium. (laughs) So an NBA exhibition game, the first game of the season, was in Decker Gymnasium the first year Decker Gymnasium was built. Paul Snyder flew in on a helicopter and landed the helicopter in his parents' backyard, and I believe it was on 2nd Street. Crazy. Huh? Who knows this stuff? Yeah, you do. (laughs) That's why I I love talking about you. But the important thing is that we should all know this. Mansfield in Tayua County is a land of opportunity. People come here and have done such incredible things. It's just hard to believe. I think sometimes we look down on ourselves and (laughs) we're just from this little place that who's ever heard of it? Who even knows about that? Yeah. Do you remember the GE commercial when it was on TV for the first, you know, night football game and the pride pride that came out of Mansfield when that was on? I did. I never saw it on TV. I've seen it. You can look online and see it. But that's what kind of started up the 1890s weekend was that celebration of the 100th anniversary of the first Under the Lights football. It did. And let me give you a little backstory about that. I was part of how that all came about. By that time, the sports information director at Mansfield, this was uh, 1991, I think, originally when we came up with the concept. I was coming back from a workshop someplace down south, and I stopped in because I'm a history guy. I just saw, as they advertised at that time, still on the side of the road, Civil War reenactment today. Great. This is, I yeah. love Civil War reenactments. <laughs> 
I stopped in and they were reacting the event. It was someplace in Kentucky or Tennessee. So I came back and I'm talking to Dennis Miller, who is director of communications for the university. Dennis Miller, for those, and I know everyone around here remember him, and he is still alive. He's retired now. One of the most creative, genius people that I've ever been around. But he was my boss. So I walked into his office and I said, Dennis, wouldn't it be great if we would reenact that first night football game? You know, do something historical sure. like that aspect of it. And he just kind of looked at me. He said, so you're going to do that? And I said, well, I can get a couple of frats. I'm sure I can get, I was an advisor for one of the frats. I said, I'm sure I can get these guys to do that. That would sound like it'd be fun. You know, we, we play in front of car lights. He said, okay, let me think about it. He walked back to my office 30 minutes later and said, all right, I talked to AP. They're sold on doing the story. Make sure that happens. <laughs> so we did the reenactment in 1991. We used fraternities and... Dennis and myself and Scott Miller and the public relations department at Mansfield came up with this concept about we found out that GE actually provided the lighting for it. We went back to the history accounts. Very hard to do at that time and made contact, talked to the university. Rod Kelschner, the president of the university, one of the great men mm -hmm. in the history of this community. Kelschner Fitness Center name lives Rod on. Rod Kelschner is still alive and all of us aspired to be who Rod Kelschner was or never to let him down. He was such a great leader of this community. He said, yeah, sounds great. We tried, we tried, we tried and we got Dick Jones, which was a company that was a networking company. But we tried to get into GE and sell them the concept. He said, we can prove you're doing it. It's your 100-year anniversary. It seems like an absolutely match for this aspect. And we couldn't get in. Finally, as time was running out for the opportunity to have Dennis Miller called a secretary at GE lighting division and said, we got this idea. We think it would be perfect. And the secretary talked to him for 10 minutes and said, I'm going to take it to my boss as soon as he comes. And it happened. One week later, three people from GE were on campus at Mansfield. And two weeks after that, Dennis went and they brought him in at GE at the corporate board to make a presentation. So GE agreed that they would provide the lighting. So the lighting that we used for that game again in 1992 was the same lighting they used to do for the temporary lighting for Penn State's Beaver Stadium's first night football game. They brought Authentic. The, uh, authentic. They brought it in. They did the commercial in Ireland. They gave us the uniforms of the commercial so that we could do that aspect yep. of it. We had a great debate out of it. We wanted more Mansfield in it. They wanted more GE in it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, they were paying the bill for it. And so they sent us different takes where they cut out. They had people running with Mansfield PA in it. And finally, they agreed to the first graphic when it came into the yeah. storyboard saying Mansfield, Pennsylvania, September 28th, 1892. And that preserved history. It doing only that. preserved history, but it created a pride in the community. And so it mirrored what Dickens would become, where the whole community would dress up, particularly the very first five years of doing that aspect of it. The fabulous 1890s weekend, the high hot air balloons, the whole thing. But the night that we reenacted that, that first time on September 28th, 1992, was a Monday night. And Monday Night Football had Oakland and Kansas on. And GE premiered that. Yeah, the commercial on that game. On that game. Awesome. You couldn't believe it. <laughs> GE flew in the top executives to the Corning Elmira Airport and the corporate jet, shuttled them down to that so they could be there during that game. Wow. Very That's interesting. Great. We are running out of time, Steve. There's so much we could talk about here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm probably boring uh, more than that. The one thing I want to say. It's been very interesting. Is, everybody thinks their story is interesting, but everybody's got an interesting they story. Do, and, and that's the great thing I about it. I never heard about how this whole GE thing and, you know, the whole story behind it and the secretary and how tough it was to make it happen. But yeah. hearing the persistence of Dennis Miller and yourself and the crew to make this happen uh, is really a neat story. Yeah, and then people bought into it. And the backstories are always the best stories. You can yeah. always read about dates and events, but it's how they got there and how mm -hmm. they created it. I just want to say, I came back to this community, to Mansfield, in 1987 on the most tragic thing that's ever happened in my life. My mother, who didn't drive, was killed in an automobile accident two weeks after coming down to see me, and I was in Venice, Florida at that time. She was going to a church meeting with a woman who did drive, but was starting to suffer the very first stages of Alzheimer's, and the woman couldn't go with somebody unless she had somebody with her in the car. And uh, stoplight was running, and my mother, it's still difficult for me to talk about it, but before I I put her on the plane in Florida. She said, I'm in Florida. I'm living 
a life that most people pay a million dollars to have now. She said, you know, you're not happy here. Why don't you come back and see if you can get back into Mansfield? And I was working for Wendy's Corporation then, and my buzzer was going off. And of course, you could walk them all the way to the gate of the plane at that time. Mm -hmm. And I kissed her goodbye, and I said, yeah. Mom. That was the last time I'm you saw your, your mom alive there? So said, yeah. And two weeks later, she had passed away. So I came back. I stayed with my father, who was absolutely devastated. I went to Mansfield. I wasn't a good student here. I was a smart kid, but not a good student. When they saw my transcripts, they said, how did we not dismiss you from school? <laughs> and Rod Kelschner stepped in, and another man, John Applenap, and they let me back in if I took five classes that I either failed or got these in back over again, which I did. But out of that worst thing that could ever happen to me, the greatest things have ever happened to me. I met my wife. I got my education. I had a job that never seemed like mm -hmm. a job because I enjoyed it so much every day. My family was raised here. And the opportunities that it has afforded me surpass anything I could ever achieve yeah. in Florida. Tallulah County and Mansfield are areas of opportunities. You can be anything you want to be and anybody you want to be here. And somebody will figure out a way to help you along the way. So... For all those, and even I complain in the winter. I probably complain more in the early spring because you're frustrated, but it's a great place to live. Yes, absolutely. And it's a great place to bring up children. And there's more opportunity here than you could ever yep. believe exists. You made your mom proud, even though she's no longer on the planet right now. Uh, she's looking down on you with pride and following her wishes, and her wishes made your life happen yeah. in a great way. It was yep. better for me here. So, yeah, yeah, all the best things. My wife, Pam, is just an incredible person. You know, Don't tell her I was born in 53. I yeah, have her believe right I was born in 63. Okay, okay. So this will be a shock to her. But, uh, <laughs> well, I'll keep this quiet. Nobody tell Pam. <laughs> well, Steve, thank you for your time and your stories and everything here on Saturday with seniors on KC 101. Appreciate you stopping by. Kevin, it's been a joy and thanks for doing this. It's a great thing. I love listening to those stories. Great people yep. and great stories. They're all on our YouTube channel. There's about 40 of them on there. If you go to uh, youtube.com and in the search bar, you can do KC 101 Hometown Country and you'll find all of them right there and have a safe